Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to yet another webinar here with uh, with us here at UE Systems. Um, my name is Maureen, and today we've got Adrian, and we're going to be talking about uh, ultrasound assisted lubrication and a little specifically about how you can utilize our Ultra Probe 401 digital grease caddy um, to help you improve your lubrication program. So excited about that. Um, Hopefully this is um, something that you guys are excited to hear a little bit more about. Um, just, you know, again, I, I, I was just joking before we started that life already kind of feels like Groundhog Day and, and we're doing so many of these webinars, it's, it's almost making it feel even more so <laughs> because I'm saying these same things every day. But for those of you who are first time um, joining us um, on this webinar, this will be fresh for you and those who aren't just Sorry, um, but uh, we do just want to make sure you guys know that we're we're here to be a resource during this time. Um, so if you've got specific questions or needs that you that, that we can help with, um, software training, things like that, you know, we we're really sad to obviously have to cancel our conference, Ultrasound World, which was always a great opportunity for folks to come and, and mix and mingle and learn more about ultrasound. And, and a lot of folks would also take advantage of our, you know, full day of software training. So um, since we can't do it in beautiful Clearwater Beach, um, just take advantage and we'll do it over the phone or do it over a Zoom or whatever, um, and we can just pretend like we're at the beach. Um, but but we're here to still provide that same training and support. So definitely take us up on that um, and don't don't hesitate to ask for for any help that we might be able to give you. Um, these webinars are kind of part of a bigger effort that we that we're doing with with our friends over at Iridicio. Um, so they've got, in addition to all these webinars we're doing and the recordings of these, which are all being archived on our website, our YouTube channel, and, and on this website here I'll mention, um, they've, they've also got some no-cost short-term project-based learning opportunities, um, lots of really great templates that you guys can take advantage of, whether you're working on improving, you know, asset criticality or PMs, whatever it might be, um, if you've got kind of a specific project that you've decided to tackle during the during this kind of crazy time, um, they've definitely got resources there to help um, in addition to some no cost coaching hours, which um, is a, a huge benefit and, and I really recommend taking advantage. So all you gotta do is jump on over to help.iridicio.com and you can um, learn a lot more over there. And, and like I said, take advantage of those coaching hours. Um, that is not something that normally they are, you know, just doing for for free so um anyway just pointing that out and then uh, just a little housekeeping before we turn it over to adrian so we are recording this i'll have it up online here later today um so if you have to hop off we'll we'll make it available to you um we definitely welcome questions so you can type those in at any time that, that you think of one um, i'll get those tossed over to adrian as it makes sense uh, throughout the presentation or of course we'll have some time at the end and if we don't get to all the questions which we usually don't have time to um, we will definitely follow up with you offline so don't worry we'll, we'll be sure to get get that answered for you and uh, my last little caveat you know I've got the kids upstairs they're supposed to be picking a movie together that they both want to watch so hopefully there's no arguing that's going to happen um, and hopefully these dogs stay quietly sleeping at my feet so if they don't, I apologize. We're all in this crazy, crazy little world together. But um, anyway, we'll do our best. So with that, Adrian, I'm going to toss it over to you. And we'll let you take okay. it away. All right. Sounds good. All right. Here we go. Uh, all right. Well, uh, thank you again for being with us uh, today, taking time out of your day uh to hopefully learn more about ultrasound assisted bearing lubrication and uh trust that you're all doing well and have been able to take advantage of some of the great learning opportunities that have been provided not just by us and uh, some of the friends that we've had uh do these series of webinars but also some of the other companies that are in the industry i've noticed a lot of good content being shared so uh yeah hopefully you've been able to take advantage of some of this learning now today uh, we're going to talk about really two uh, bearing relubrication strategies. We're going to talk about time-based lubrication and condition-based bearing lubrication. 
and how the Ultra Probe 401 digital grease caddy can be used in either bearing relubrication strategy. Uh, now, I always kind of lead off with this, but uh, at UE Systems, one of the things that uh, really has made us who we are today in the industry uh, when it comes to airborne and structure borne ultrasound. And uh, I think what most of you would know from uh, you know, your experience with us is we really pride ourselves in support. So if you have our equipment at your plant or facility, and uh, if you feel like it's not being used effectively, or uh, if you need some equipment specific training, maybe some uh, software specific assistance, uh, even though we can't get into your plant right now, more than likely, uh, we have been doing a tremendous number of one-on-one -on -one web based type uh, support uh, sessions, uh, equipment specific training, application specific uh, presentations. So um, my contact information will be on the last slide here. So uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we've always been under the belief that if you have our equipment, we want you to be the best users of that equipment as possible. So uh, again, we're we're here for you during this time, and uh, now would be a great time more than ever to uh, to take advantage of some of the one-on-one -on -one support that you can get from us. So uh, feel free to reach out to us. We we welcome that. So just as an introduction here, uh, you know we think about you know time-based lubrication PMs or time-based PMs and uh, preventive maintenance in general. So, you know, they're, they're time-based or cycle-based actions performed to hopefully prevent system or asset functional failure. So uh, hopefully there's some value being brought about in these timed-based uh, maintenance that, we, that we're doing. Um, so it's worth our time to go out and do them. But hopefully the value brought to our reliability strategy is to detect or prevent failure modes that can be prevented with regular maintenance, uh, have a likelihood of failure that increases with time. So as our equipment ages, you know, it may make more sense to do more time-based PMs on that equipment. And then time-based PMs or time-based preventive maintenance can be an effective strategy on lower criticality assets. Uh, you know, there's some assets that you may have that may not require or doesn't make sense to do extensive ultrasound or vibration routes, but yet we still need to do some time-based or cycle-based maintenance to that asset. And then we think about, you know, condition-based maintenance or CBM uh, in that, you know, with this strategy, you know, we're using tools like ultrasound or vibration analysis or oil analysis where we're continuously monitoring the condition or the health of the asset in order to make a decision on what maintenance should be done. So the value that we hope that that strategy is bringing to us and that is that, um, you know, CBM can be more efficient because unnecessary time-based PMs can possibly be eliminated. So again, we're making better use of our time by not going out and doing, uh, you know, unspecific or, you know, unnecessary time-based PMs. But again, we're using uh, that time to collect regular data, uh, condition-based data on that asset. Uh, typically, you know, we're going to find failure modes much, much earlier than just a uh, time-based uh, PM or maintenance strategy. And if we're making good use of our condition monitoring data, so if we're actually, you know, finding things with our condition uh, monitoring tools, uh, then that work can then be planned and scheduled accordingly so we can uh, even help with planning and scheduling. So, you know, that's just some of the value that uh, CBM maintenance strategy can bring to you. And then, you know, uh, in thinking about how bearings fail, uh, you know, if you look at any study that's been done on why bearings fail early, uh, typically those studies will attribute premature bearing failures due to lubrication related issues. Uh, typically, that's going to be over lubrication, under lubrication, uh, using the wrong grease for the wrong application, and then lubricant contamination. Uh, now, these tend to be friction or uh, also temperature related failure modes. So some of the warning signs, if you've ever, you know, done any kind of forensics on uh, some of your equipment failures, you've probably noticed uh, discolored ball tracks or bearings, excessive wear due to overheating or increased temperatures. Uh, sometimes just visually you can walk by a piece of equipment and you've got such an increase in temperatures that you've got visual uh, breakdown of the lubricant. Uh, so again, the increased temperatures uh, are going to cause lubricant breakdown. And then adhesive wear. So as you know, with friction, you know, you've got expansion of metals, 
so we'll tend to see some uh, failure modes like scoring, scuffing, and seizing. And again, those are friction or temperature related type failure modes. So ultrasound technology, uh, if you're not familiar with uh, UE systems and what our instruments do, um, you know, just some of the core applications here, uh, what we can do with our handheld uh, instruments. Obviously, energy savings, uh, that's typically uh, going to be the place where people like to start, just simply because these are two of the easier applications where you can deploy ultrasound, and it's going to be two applications where you can have the quickest return on investment. Uh, that's going to be with compressed air and compressed gas leaks and steam trap inspection. Uh, so it's been very typical for us over the years to see people who have used ultrasound just for these two applications alone and have documented savings, uh, usually into the hundreds of thousands of dollars over time, sometimes into the millions of dollars over time. Uh, and it's very easy to do. Uh, we've made it even easier with our two apps that we have available. So if you go out into Google Play or uh, the App Store and just search UE Systems, uh, two of the apps that you'll see are these energy documentation and reporting apps. Uh, one is called the Leak Survey which is used for compressed air and compressed gas leak detection and reporting. And then the other is the steam survey app, and that would be for your steam trap reporting. So uh, not only can we identify compressed air leaks or we can identify uh, failed or faulty steam traps, but we can also quantify those and we can actually put a dollar amount to how much they're actually costing you. So uh, when people are first getting into the technology, uh, the energy savings applications are typically going to be where, where they'll start, uh, just again because it's easy to do and uh, it's an easy way to justify the cost of uh, investing in ultrasound. Now, the majority of our users, so once they've kind of gone through and justified the, uh, the use or the investment for ultrasound, uh, then they tend to move to what I would consider to be more advanced types of applications and that's going to be bearing condition monitoring, uh, even to the point to where uh, they will lead first with ultrasound and then follow with a complementary technology, uh, just because it's quicker to collect the data, it's easier to interpret the data. And uh, if we think about trending the decibel level, so when we talk about sound, the unit of measurement for sound is measured in decibel or dB. Uh, so when we go out and make contact with that bearing, that bearing is making noise, and the ultra probe will show us the decibel level reading for that bearing. So if we're trending that decibel level over time, if that decibel level starts to increase, it means that a change has taken place. So uh, again, it's a really good leading indicator of a potential problem. And if we know the amount of increase in dB above the previous reading or above a baseline dB, uh, we pretty well know what that problem is. Uh, so as we get into this presentation, I will give you what the alarm level recommendations are for bearing condition monitoring. And then electrical inspection. Uh, the primary driver for this application is safety. Uh, and we're seeing more and more users uh, use ultrasound in conjunction with traditional infrared scans of energized electrical equipment to where we can listen first before we ever open anything up to do an infrared scan or a visual inspection. So if you have faults like corona tracking or arcing taking place inside of your equipment, that sound will exit out wherever there's an opening. So we can simply scan around the seal of the door of the cabinet, uh, louvers, vent openings, and we'll be able to be forewarned about any potential problems before we open up that piece of equipment. So in a way, it's a way to help reduce the risk or the chance of an arc flash. Now, just like an infrared camera sees what you can't see, uh, or an accelerometer feels what you can't feel, ultrasound hears what you can't hear. Uh, and the instrument will take those high frequency sounds that we can't hear and translate that down into an audible that we can hear in the headset as we're doing our inspection, or uh, we get a visual readout on board the instrument in either DB, or if you're using an Ultra Probe 15000, we can actually uh, see the FFT or the time waveform uh, right on board the display of the instrument. Uh, so we can do some on the spot uh, diagnostics on what's happening with that piece of equipment. And like I said before, uh, we're measuring that sound in DB. 
Uh, and we're listening for these sounds uh, above 20 kilohertz. So the uh, most of our instruments, including the Ultra Probe 401, will have frequency tuning capability. So we can tune it according to what the application is. Uh, in our uh, case here today, and talking about bearing lubrication, the Ultra Probe 401 digital grease caddy will come set to the fact from the factory at a frequency setting of 30 kilohertz, and that is the optimal. Uh, frequency setting for bearing inspection. So it'll it'll come right out of the box uh, already preset for the optimal frequency for bearing condition monitoring. And then there are different sources of high frequency sound. Uh, so we have turbulence. Uh, that turbulence can be either a pressure leak to atmosphere or air in leakage like a vacuum leak. Um, you can also have internal turbulence uh, across a valve or a steam trap. So if you have a valve that's leaking by, uh, there's going to be flow that's restricted uh, across that uh, seat or orifice. And that in turn creates the turbulence that we hear with an ultra probe on the outlet or the discharge side of the valve. Uh, ionization, uh, the faults that we mentioned earlier with corona tracking and arcing. Uh, those are ionization-based faults that will produce sound that we're able to hear with an ultra probe. Impacting, uh, like slow speed bearings, uh, typically at UE Systems, when we refer to slow speed bearings, uh, we're talking about 100 RPM and below. Uh, what happens is with the slower speed bearings, uh, there's not, they just don't produce enough high frequency sound um, that sometimes you can't even measure a decibel level with. But when you have faults that start to occur, uh, even at the slower rotations, uh, those faults will produce a subtle uh, click or a pop or a tick or a screech. Um, and you'll be able to not only hear that in the headset, but if you record the sound of it and play it back, uh, those anomalies show up really nicely on your time waveform. And primarily what we're going to talk about today is friction. Uh, that's going to be bearings in need of lubrication. Uh, we've already talked about some of those uh, warning signs to look for uh, when you have premature bearing failures. Uh, so we talk about friction, which in turn, when you have increases in friction, uh, that leads to increases in temperatures. And that's why you start to see that lubricant breaking down or the discoloration in your metals or the, the bearing raceway. Um, so in our case, when you have friction, there's going to be an increase in noise. So what we can expect to see and then hear uh, when we're out there with our Ultra Probe 401, and again, the uh, Ultra Probe will give us the decibel level once we make contact with that bearing. So what we want to see is if that bearing needs grease, there will be a gradual decrease in dB as grease is added. So as grease enters the bearing housing, there's less friction, therefore less noise. And then once it drops, it's not likely to fall anymore. So there's no need to apply more grease after it has fallen to see if the decibel level will continuously uh, or continue to fall. Uh, once it drops, it's not likely to fall anymore. So at that point, we can stop adding grease. Now, if the bearing doesn't need grease, uh, so the response is typically uh, fairly quick uh, on the Ultra Pro, but if that bearing doesn't need any grease, then as we start to apply grease, the decibel level will gradually rise as more grease is added. So uh, again, when we apply more grease than what's needed, that also in turn uh, produces more friction and therefore more noise uh, in that bearing. So if as we apply more grease, the decibel level will gradually rise. So if we see this on the grease caddy, then we know that we need to stop. And then the third scenario is if there's no change in dB while greasing, then we need to do a follow-up inspection to determine why there was no change. Uh, typically what we've seen over the years uh, and the feedback that we've gotten is, you know, through previous over lubrication, if the seal has been compromised, then all of the grease that we're pumping in now is going out into areas of that equipment where it should not be. And therefore we would see little to no change in dB. Uh, now, you could have a case to where maybe you have a bearing that's already in a failure mode, 
uh, where it's already showing some wear or fatigue or has some kind of physical damage, uh, and lubrication is not the solution for that. So in that case, uh, you can apply grease to that bearing, and uh, typically that will not change the decibel level. Uh, but either way, in that case, if we have applied grease and there's been no change in dB, then we need to do a follow-up inspection. Maybe we need to come out with vibration analysis to, uh, to do a complementary scan. Uh, if you have an Ultra Probe 10,000 or 15,000, maybe we need to uh, re-record the sound file and compare that to our baseline sound file uh, to see if we note any kind of bearing fault frequencies. Uh, either way, uh, a follow-up inspection should be done. All right, so the Ultra Probe 401 uh, specifically, I wanted to spend a little time on this because um, this is, you know, one of the main things that we wanted to talk about today. Uh, this uh, Ultra Probe has been around for a few years now. Uh, we've got quite a few of them out uh, with uh, some great results coming back from those that have used it. Uh, but it's basically, it's a digital version of our previous model, which was the Ultra Probe 201 that many of you are probably familiar with, the original Grease Caddy. Uh, but with the Ultra Probe 401, uh, I'll just highlight some of the uh, the features here. Uh, we've already talked about the frequency tuning capability. Uh, so like I said, it will come set from the factory from us uh, at 30 kilohertz, which is the optimal frequency for bearing uh, inspection. The only time that you would want to look to adjust that would be on your slower RPM bearings. Uh, so again, anything typically below 100 RPM, you may want to adjust that frequency down into the 20 to 25 kilohertz range. Uh, and that'll give you uh, better results on your slower speed bearings. You can store as many as 400 points of data. So we can create a route of up to 400 points, load that route from the software into the Grease Caddy. Um, if you have more than 400 points, uh, it would be necessary to either break those up into smaller routes. Uh, typically, we'll, we'll teach that uh, for good data management, uh, ease of data collection, no more than about 150 points per route. Uh, now, the good thing in the software is you can have um, uh, a significant number of routes uh, created underneath the same plant, underneath the same application. Uh, but if you had more data that you wanted to collect, um, the data is stored via a removable SD card. So if you had, you know, three routes that you wanted to collect all at one time, you could have three different SD cards with a different route loaded onto each SD card. So once you're through with one route, you just simply take the SD card out, put another SD card in with a different route, and uh, it'll automatically load whatever route is on that, uh, that new SD card. You can uh, store a before lube reading and an after lube reading. So once you have a route established, uh, if you do reach a point that's currently an alarm, if you decide to apply grease to that bearing, we can take a before lube reading and then an after lube reading. And then we can also input in the number of pumps of grease that we added. So part of the data that it will store is we can input in that number of pumps of grease and we can now start to track and trend how much grease we're using. Uh, the good thing about the Ultra Probe 401 is it does work with our uh, remote access sensors or the RAS sensors that many of you are familiar with. Uh, these would be in use if you have equipment that is inaccessible due to uh, distance or safety or guarding. You can go in when it's safe to do so, uh, mount the sensor, and then run the cable out and it'll plug in directly to the Ultra Probe or you can bring as many as eight of those RASs together to one location uh, to an eight channel junction box. And then you can just simply plug in from the junction box uh, to the ultra probe and we can take as many as eight readings from one location. Uh, it is a lithium polymer rechargeable battery. On a uh, full charge, you should be getting seven to eight hours of continuous use out of it. It does have an LED light if you're in uh, some dark areas. And uh, it will come standard with a wired headset uh, that is ANSI and OSHA approved for noise isolating, uh, but, but a wireless is uh, available. So if you want to make it uh, even easier to use or if you have uh, safety measures in place where you can't have cables uh, dangling around, then you can get a wireless headset for it. Here's a closer look at the, uh, the instrument and the display panel. Of course, you can see uh, the removable SD card slot here. 
And again, uh, all of your data storage is done via SD card. Uh, we'll get a closer look at the display panel. Uh, here's your uh, connection here for your BNC cable. And again, you can plug in the standard uh, magnetic mount contact probe that comes with it or the remote access sensor. Uh, here's your recharge jack. Uh, here's a, your LED light. Of course, your headset jack. You'd always want to make sure you wear the headset. Uh, even though we can get a visual here on the display, it's still a good practice to listen to that bearing and not rely solely on just uh, what you're seeing visually on the instrument. Uh, of course, your power on and power off, and then uh, the sensitivity spin and click dial. So uh, this dial serves a dual purpose, so not only can we scroll left or right, uh, to adjust things, adjust sensitivity, but we can also uh, press and release that sen sensitivity dial, and that's how we're able to navigate around the screen to our different uh, features and adjustments. Now, the Ultra Probe 401, you know, we show it here attached directly to a grease gun, but it will come with a belt worn holster. And that tends to be the way that most people will uh, prefer to use this. Uh, that way, you know, if they have two or three different types of grease guns or, you know, different grease guns with different types of grease in them, instead of attaching and reattaching this to the grease guns, uh, they can have that in the holster. And then it's just a matter of just wearing that on your belt, wearing that on your side. And then all you're walking around with is your grease gun and the magnet. Uh, it will come with this little docking plate uh, or docking station. So it's just something that attaches down here near the end of the grease nozzle. Uh, it makes a really good resting place for that magnet uh, if you are using this attached to the grease gun. Uh, and that's really the purpose of that docking station. Uh, we'll talk about where we want to make contact um, because, again, by nature, high-frequency sound is very low energy. So the closer we are to that bearing, the better the results that will be. And, uh, and again, here is... Uh, again, the preferred location is going to be the closest point to the bearing or the bearing housing here. Um, and, you know, even better is if you have the grease fitting extensions that extend up, you know, just one inch to two inches above the bearing housing, you can take that magnet and just pop that right on the side of that grease fitting. Uh, the thing that we like about that is, you know, we're testing in the same location every single time. So we're using that grease fitting as our contact point. And then that grease fitting extension acts as like a, an extension of the contact probe, if you will. So that sound travels pretty well via that contact probe. Uh, whatever location you choose to make contact, just make sure that you mark that in a way to where we, we know that that's our contact placement. And uh, that way we're testing in the same location every single time. Uh, we do have or we offer uh, mounting pads. Uh, they're just little round uh, mounting discs that actually say ultrasonic test point. Uh, so that way, no matter who comes up, they're going to know, okay, I need to make contact here. Uh, the center of that disc has just a slight indention to where uh, if you're using the contact probe or the stethoscope module, it uh, makes a perfect place to rest that uh, the tip of the stethoscope module into. Uh, here's a picture of the remote access sensor. Uh, again, uh, these are stud mounted or contact mounted sensors that will plug in directly to the grease caddy. Uh, we make these on cable lengths uh, as short as three feet or as long as 100 feet. And, and again, it's a, a great way to be able to listen to equipment that you normally don't have access to to due to uh, safety or if you have equipment that's just inaccessible due to distance. Uh, it's, it's a safe way to be able to listen to that equipment and still be able to apply grease to it as long as you have those grease fittings extended out to where you can have access to those. All right, so on your operation of the Ultra Probe 401, uh, of course, your power on and power off. Uh, we're going to press and hold that, and you'll see the, uh, the main display come up. And uh, if you have a, an SD card inserted that has a route loaded onto it, it will automatically load whatever route is on that SD card. Uh, to power off, we're just going to press and hold for approximately five seconds, and then you'll see the Ultra Pro power off. The sensitivity spin and click dial, again, serves a dual purpose. Uh, it's a way for us to uh, press that, press in and release, and that's how we're able to navigate around the display to make our dis different adjustments from the sensitivity uh, to our function bar or maybe to 
uh, navigate the route. Uh, so if we need to advance forward or skip over points, all that's done via the sensitivity spin and click dial. Uh, we mentioned the recharging, again, continuous use of seven to eight hours on a, on a full charge, and then the BNC connection. Just make sure that our magnetic mount transducer uh, or contact probe is connected. All right, here's a closer look at the display. Uh, so we'll start over here with the sensitivity. So uh, the top left, uh, where we have this S equals number. So what the sensitivity is, and this is available on all of our instruments, uh, but the sensitivity is basically a gain. So when I turn up the sensitivity, I'm increasing the amount of power that goes to those piezoelectric crystals inside of the different modules. Uh, so in this case, uh, we see in the middle here, we see some little dashes and uh, there would be a, an arrow pointing to the right here. When you see the arrow pointing to the right, it's basically telling you that it's not picking up anything. It's telling you to turn up the sensitivity. Uh, so if we were to make contact with the bearing here, uh, more than likely the arrow would go away and we would see a decibel level number here in the middle. Uh, so where this, uh, the, these blinking dashes are in this arrow, uh, once we have the instrument in range or once we're making contact with something, uh, we'll see that arrow go away and we'll get a decibel level reading here. Now, if we see the arrow pointing back to the left, that's telling me to turn down the sensitivity. So it's telling me that the sensitivity is too high to be able to measure how much noise this bearing is generating. So either way, the instrument will tell you in which direction to turn the sensitivity. So with the sensitivity at the maximum setting is 70 and it will go all the way down to zero. Now the, the sensitivity has no effect on the decibel level. So eventually if we turn this down too low uh, to where the decibel level goes away and we get the blinking arrow pointing back to the right, uh, we've turned the sensitivity down too low. So we'll just simply turn it back to the right, increase the sensitivity and the arrow will go away and we'll get our decibel level number. Uh, again, it has no effect on the decibel level. It's just a way for me to bring the instrument into range to be able to measure how much noise that bearing is generating. And then across the top where we see uh, motor one, whoops, we see motor, I'm sorry, motor two, and then we see the uh, MIB or the motor inboard. This is the machine name and the point name. So however we name the route or name our points in the software, when we load it into the Grease Caddy, however we name it there is how it will show up here on the display. So it will let us know at any given time where we are along the route. Now moving around to the right, you see in this case, we see a 006 here that just lets me know that I'm on record number six. And again, we can have up to 400 points loaded in here uh, at a given time. The number here on the uh, middle right is uh, the baseline DB. So once we've gone out and taken the initial reading, so we've created the route, we load the route into the grease caddy and we go out and collect those initial round of uh, decibel level readings. The next time we load the route in here, it's gonna bring over the baseline DB. So the UltraTrend DMS software that we'll talk about, it will default and set the first reading that you download into it as the baseline. But we can change that baseline at any, at any time. So, uh, and that's just a simple uh, one click of the mouse and we can change the baseline. Uh, but when we load that route in here, whatever the baseline is for each one of these points, it'll bring over the baseline DB. So we're going to know at any given time along the route what the baseline DB is for each one of those points along our route. Now, the number in the lower right-hand corner, so in this case it says zero, zero, this would be how many pumps of grease that we're going to add. So uh, in order to do that, so in this case, the, or the way that I prefer to do it, uh, is to use the power on and power off button. So if we grease this bearing and let's say we put four pumps of grease, then we would just hit that power button one, two, three, four times. And you'll see this number change from zero, zero, and it'll count up as you press and release that power button. Uh, until the desired number of pumps of grease has been added. And then the function bar. So uh, whatever is down here at the bottom, so in this case it says store record. Uh, in this case, this would be my function. So if I want to store reading for this motor two motor inboard bearing, I would just simply press and hold the sensitivity bar or the uh, sensitivity button. 
and then it, you would see on the screen, it would flash up store record confirmed, and it will advance forward to the next point. All right, you do have two uh, display settings. Uh, it's just simply called display one, display two. Uh, in the display one mode, uh, you're gonna see the sensitivity. You'll see the record number, the machine name and the point name. You'll see the decibel level uh, here in the middle, and then you'll see the function bar. More than likely, this will be the display of choice uh, when you're using this. But you do have the option for display two to where you only see the sensitivity, the record number, the bar graph on the bottom here. Uh, so that's a, just basically an intensity meter and your function bar. Uh, but again, mo more than likely display one will be uh, the preferred uh, display for regular use. All right, so we're gonna load a route. Uh, so you can go into the UltraTrend DMS software. Uh, if you don't have the software, uh, it is available for download right from uesystems.com. Uh, and the latest version is we're into DMS 6. Uh, it looks identical to previous versions that you may be familiar with, such as DMS 5. Uh, but we have, I guess the biggest change would be from DMS 5 to DMS 6. Uh, we did move from an access-based database to a SQL database. Uh, so we found that it's just, uh, it makes for an easier means of, uh, you know, manipulating and doing things with your data. Uh, but one of the biggest changes in moving from that platform is you'll see in the top right-hand corner a UE forecast button. So uh, we had to have a way or a platform in order to be able to communicate with our uh, UE forecast, which is a new 24-7 uh, continuous monitoring product that we have available. Uh, so that was really the, the biggest move there. Uh, but as far as the tree and, uh, you know, your naming, your points, all that should look very familiar to you if you've used previous versions of the UltraTrend DMS software. So what we want to do is we want to go into the DMS and we want to create a plant and then specify the bearing application. And then we name the route or the group. And then we begin to enter in our assets. We enter the machine names and the point names. So then what we do is we take the SD card, we put that into our PC and we do configure probes. So uh, that configure probe step is a one-time step uh, that you have to tell the software what ultra probe that we're using. So this software works with uh, five different ultra probes. So the software doesn't know what ultra probe you have until you tell it. So we would do configure probes it will look for what is connected. It'll recognize the SD card. And one of your options would be the UP401 on whatever drive or port that you used. And as long as you always use that same drive or that same port, uh, you'll never have to do that step again. You just have to tell the software what Ultra Probe uh, we're using. So once we've done that, then we're going to send group to probe. So we just simply highlight our uh, route that we just created, and we're going to right click and then do send group to probe. From that point, we'll take the SD card out of our computer and we'll insert that into the Ultra Probe 401, power it on, and it'll automatically load the route that we just created from the software. All right, so then storing a reading or uh, storing a record. Uh, we've already talked about this uh, previously, but we would wanna make sure that we go down to the function bar. So using the sensitivity spin and click dial, uh, we're gonna navigate down to the function bar. Uh, once that function bar is blinking from that point, we just then either scroll left or right using the sensitivity dial until we see store record. Once we're there and once we're ready to store a reading, uh, once we've got a decibel level here on the display, we're just going to simply press and hold the sensitivity dial, and then that's where we'll see store record confirmed. And then the grease caddy will automatically advance forward to the next point. So we've just stored a reading on that, on that point. All right, so then getting the data from the grease caddy back into the software. So we go back to the UltraTrend DMS. We highlight or select the route that we've just taken, make sure that's the correct one. 
Uh, we're going to remove the SD card. We'll make sure we power off the grease caddy and then take the SD card out, put that back into our PC. And then we're going to uh, right click on our route and we'll see the option retrieve group from probe. So send group to probe is going to send that route from the software over to the SD card. But once we're through collecting our data, we're going to right click and we're going to select retrieve group from probe and that will take our data from the SD card data that we just stored and it will download it into our route here and that's where you'll see your dates and times uh, from those uh, readings that we just have taken. So that's downloading data from the Grease Caddy into the software. All right, so where can we use the Ultra Probe 401 if we're going to do either time based lubrication or condition based lubrication? Well, first of all, the, the tendency for time based lubrication alone is to over lubricate. You know, think about it, you know, we're going out with a PM that says to apply a certain number of pumps of grease at this frequency. So typically, you know, it's going to be every month, every few weeks. Um, and that's what we do. So we're solely basing how much we grease and how often we grease uh, based off of that timed uh, PM. So you can kind of see that the tendency is typically too much too often. But if you want to continue on a time-based lubrication strategy, then at a minimum, add in a grease caddy. Uh, this will let you know when you've applied enough grease. Uh, it'll take the guesswork out of how much to apply. Uh, we see a lot of people adjusting their time-based lubrication PMs based off of their ultrasound results. So uh, in this scenario, uh, just as an example, if we have a time-based lubrication PM that says to go to a certain piece of equipment and apply, let's say, six pumps of grease. But let's say if we're using the grease caddy uh, and we're watching the decibel level, let's say we get to four pumps of grease and the decibel level falls. Well, in that case, there's no reason to put two more pumps of grease into that bearing. At that point, we're all, we have the potential to over lubricate that bearing. Uh, so again, it takes our time-based lubrication PM and it makes it a little more precise in that, uh, again, we're using ultrasound to, to tell us when we need to stop greasing. Now, on the other hand, let's say we have that lubrication PM and let's say that, uh, again, it calls for six pumps of grease. But let's say after two pumps of grease, the decibel level starts to increase. Uh, again, we don't need to put four more pumps of grease into that bearing because we're going to run the risk of over lubricating the bearing. So that bearing in that scenario did not need any more grease. Uh, so again, that's where we, we say, you know, again, it will let us know when to stop applying grease. It'll let us know, um, again, when we've applied enough and if we've started to apply too much grease. So that's how the Ultra Probe 401 would be used in a time-based lubrication scenario. Now, condition-based, uh, you know, is kind of going to be the best approach, and this is what you can do with the Ultra Probe 401. So, for those of you that have it, uh, or you know, may have some interest, you know, this is the scenario where you'll get the best results out of that digital grease caddy. And it, it kind of talks about, you know, really what we we mentioned with the software to where we set up routes. And then we load that route into the grease caddy and we're going to go out and take our additional initial round of decimal level readings and we're going to download that back into the software. Uh, now, a better way to set your baselines uh, instead of letting the DMS software uh, use the first reading that you download into it is you can use what's called the historical method. So we set up the route and we begin to establish a db trend or db history on those points and then we can select any reading that we want to as the baseline so uh, another good practice would be to uh, take a grease gun out with us and when we are taking those initial round of uh, decibel level readings if we apply grease to a bearing and the decibel level falls that's a good reading to take and use as your baseline because that bearing was already in need of grease. So just, you know, something to keep in mind there. So once we've established our baseline, then we can set those two alarm levels that I referenced earlier. And uh, these are the recommended values uh, when it comes to establishing your two alarm levels. 
And you can set those based off of these delta values. So if you have an 8 dB increase above your baseline, that means a lack of lubrication for that bearing. At 16 dB above baseline, that's going to be the point now to where that bearing has started to show some wear or fatigue. And you can apply grease to that bearing, and the decibel level may not come down anywhere close to what it should be at the baseline. So at that point, uh, we're going to need to uh, monitor this more closely. Uh, we could also follow up with a complementary technology uh, like vibration analysis, or uh, if we have a 10,000 or a 15,000, we can re-record the sound file uh, and, again, look for any kind of bearing fault frequency that may be occurring. So once these initial readings have been taken, once the baselines have been set, uh, we're going to be trending the decibel level over time. And then any points that are currently in the low alarm status would be the points that we apply grease to. So, again, instead of going out to grease everything like we normally would on a time-based lubrication PM, then we let ultrasound let us know when it's time to be greased. And, again, that's going to be uh, points that are currently in the low alarm status. And we can use this data now to generate reports. Uh, so for each one of the applications in the DMS software, uh, we have application-specific reports. So uh, you'll notice here, uh, when you go into the DMS software, you'll see a Reports tab here. Now, for the bearing application, we have some lubrication-specific fields down here. And uh, again, this is going to be information that will be pulled directly from your UltraProbe 401 to where we know the actual number of pumps of grease. So if we did apply grease to a bearing, we can store that information on the grease caddy. Uh, when we set up the route, if we know the planned number of pumps of grease, uh, now we can track and trend how much grease we're using, you know, actual number of pumps compared to what was planned. Uh, if we have a calibrated or a metered grease gun, then we're gonna know how much grease we're using mass-wise. And then we also give you a field here to where uh, if we know the cost of that grease, so if we know how much that tube of grease is costing, then we know how much grease we're using dollar-wise. And, uh, and we can use that information uh, that I'll show you in just a moment that will give you a lubrication cost benefit and loss report. Now, a lot of people like to see just simple trends of their data. Uh, so you have that ability. So if I want to see a trend of this motor one motor outboard bearing, I just simply click on that motor outboard bearing, click on chart, and uh, we're looking at two things on this chart. Uh, so in this case, we're using uh, 30 dB as the baseline, and we're plotting our historical readings, and we see uh, the low alarm plotted uh, and the high alarm plotted. So we can see how our decimal level has uh, continued, in this case, to trend upwards. And then the bottom graph is showing us the planned number of pumps of grease compared to what we actually put. And anything you want to see on this chart uh, can be selected in the history tab. So uh, if you didn't want to see the number of pumps of grease, you could just go into the history tab, uh, take those off the chart, move them over to the right, and then go back to the chart. And then the only thing you would see would be your decimal level readings. But anything you want to see on the chart, uh, you would choose that in the history tab. Okay, so here's that lubrication cost benefit uh, and loss rep uh, report. Uh, and again, this is going to be in the bearing application. And then you'll click on reports. And it's in the software as lube fields report. Uh, but this is the, the information that it will give you. So, uh, Pretty significant route here, uh, quite a few points uh, that were uh, where data was collected. Uh, I won't go through each one of these, but you have a report tab here at the bottom. So when you click on that report tab, it's basically a way to track the progress or to see the results from your lubrication route that was ran with your uh, UltraProbe 401. So you can see here the planned number of pumps of grease. So this route, uh, they had planned to use 5,550 pumps of grease, but they only used 247. So a lot of the, the points that needed grease didn't need grease, or a lot of the points where uh, they had planned to use a certain number of pumps of grease based off ultrasound, obviously they didn't use that many. 
they had a calibrated uh, grease gun, so they knew the injected mass, how much grease they actually used. They knew how much that grease was costing, so they had planned to use $90.44, but they only used $4.02, so they had a savings of $86.40. Uh, again, doesn't sound like much just for this one route, but if you had, say, 12 or 15 different routes or more uh, to where you had this information, the, the numbers could start to really add up. So, again, we, uh, we go out and we collect all this data. Now, what do we do with this data? And, uh, again, we can create some really nice reports, uh, and this is one of them to where we can actually show a dollar amount to uh, what our lubrication program is doing. So just wrapping up here, uh, you know, in talking about a dollar amount, uh, you know, build your business case. Uh, it's been typical to get feedback and see uh, reductions of around 30% in the amount of grease use. So once this is implemented, it's pretty typical to see that. Um, you know, if you're in a plant or a facility where you're having lubrication-related issues, um, and again, typically from our experiences, uh, we tend to see more failures due to over-lubrication than under lubrication, you know, be sure to factor in any downtime avoidance costs. Uh, if you're doing root cause analysis on some of your more critical equipment, um, you know, again, you know, set, set that as and use that information to help you uh, build the business case for this. Um, you know, again, if you're having failures due to over lubrication, if you uh, are sending a lot of motors uh, out for rebuild where uh, when they break into those motors, they're seeing grease in places where it shouldn't be, uh, you can have some significant uh, savings initially, not only just from the reduction in the amount of grease being used, but, you know, if we have less motors that are being sent out to be rebuilt, uh, if we have less bearing failures, you know, it's really going to add up. But it's important to be sure that you document those, um, including, you know, putting a dollar amount to those uh, findings. You know, if we think about it, you know, investment in the grease caddy uh, is very minimal compared to that potential payback. Um, Make sure that you invest in training. Uh, like I said earlier, you know, there's been some really good content being shared uh, during this time when we've got extra time in our, our offices or we're not out, you know, traveling as much. Um, but invest in training for uh, the people who are responsible for lubricating your equipment. You know, make sure that they understand and know how important their job is to the overall reliability of that equipment. Uh, I would consider uh, or have you consider updating your out-of-date lubrication PMs and procedures. Uh, when those PMs or procedures were written, do they even still apply for the equipment that is currently out in your plant or facility? Um, you know, just take a, take a look, you know, take a moment and, and update those, um, you know, and you may, may uncover some, uh, some things you didn't know. And uh, if you've ever heard me talk about lubrication, you know I'm going to mention this, but make sure you calibrate your grease guns. Um, you know, we've got to know how much grease is coming out of there at a full pump. Uh, write that on the grease gun, mark it in a way to where we know how much grease we're using. Um, there are also some really nice metered grease gun attachments that you can attach pretty much to any grease gun uh, that will give you the amount of grease that is actually being applied. Uh, so we can kind of take it and make it more specific. So instead of saying a certain number of pumps of grease, you know, we can say uh, apply a certain amount of grease mass wise. Uh, just, you know, again, a good practice for you to get into. So that pretty much wraps it up unless we have some uh, some questions that may have come in. Uh, again, here's my contact information. Uh, look forward to hearing from you. Uh, we do have a a new procedure that we've written uh, for bearing inspection and lubrication. I'd be glad to share that with you as well. Uh, but Maureen, do we have any questions? Yeah, we do. We've got a couple, so we'll get to what we can. And um, certainly feel free to put them in, because even if we don't get to them, we'll, we'll get, like we said, um, with you offline. Um, so one question that came in was about whether or not the 401 is rated um, for use in um, you know, different classification yeah. settings. Yeah. Un yeah, unfortunately, the Ultra Probe 401 does not have uh, an intrinsically safe or ATEX rating on it. Uh, we do have a couple of instruments that do, uh, but the Ultra Probe 401 specifically is not rated. 
And what about if so someone's asking, so they've got, for instance, a 10, a, a 10,000 or for people who have a 15 or a nine or, you know, any of the ultra probes, um, can they use those as a quote unquote grief caddy? Uh, yeah, you could. Um, if you're, if you're going to do that, then I would make sure that you get a, uh, get the belt worn holster for either one of those. I mean, it, they're really a nice holster. So, uh, it'll actually come with a molded pouch for, the ultra probe, uh, as well as a smaller pouch for any accessories you want to take out. Uh, and of course, they're going to come standard with the magnet. So if you're wearing the ultra probe on your side in the holster, then all you're walking around with is the magnet. So uh, you you could potentially use those as greasing devices. Uh, and it might be a good way to to start out and give that a try. Uh, and then, you know, once you find that you're getting some good results with it, maybe then choose to invest in the grease caddy. Uh, but yeah, you certainly could. Um, but I would make sure that you have the holster. I just think it would be easier to use, uh, using that in the holster. I was talking about other... it. Sorry. I, sorry, I was talking. I had I forgot to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> no, so I'm seeing a little bit of a theme with several of these questions, so we'll hit this one last. Um, and I know you covered it, but just kind of, again, go over a little bit on baselines. That always seems to be something people are like, well, do we have like a list of like general baseline readings of normal bearings or, you know, what are, what, what can you kind of just one last thought on, on baselines and kind of give people some peace yeah. of mind on how they can go about doing that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Very, very common question when we're in front of people talking about this. But, you know, again, the, uh, the software will default to the first reading that you take and download into it from the Grease Caddy. It'll set that as the baseline. Uh, but you can change that baseline at any given time. So I kind of talked a little bit about the historical method to where we set up the route and we begin to go out and acquire, you know, kind of that initial round of data. So we kind of build an initial trend. Uh, and then you can set, you can use any one of those uh, readings as the baseline. Um, now, what some of you may be thinking is, well, what if I set a baseline on a piece, piece of equipment that is already failing? Well, and we get that question asked a lot, too, because where ultrasound is deployed a lot of times is where people aren't currently doing any kind of condition monitoring. So they know that they have the potential of when they go out to make contact and listen with ultrasound, that the potential could be that everything they listen to is, is bad or failing. Um, but if you do set a baseline on a piece of equipment that is already in a failure mode, what you'll see there is you'll see the decibel level continuously trending upward. So if we go out and we're taking readings and that decibel level continues to trend upwards, even after in some cases where we've applied grease, um, you know, if you've caught the failure early enough, you know, you could have a, a quick rise in dB due to that early failure that we've detected. So, uh, you know, again, if you continue to see the decimal level trending upwards, then we pretty well can guarantee that we've set a baseline on a piece of equipment that is already failing. Um, but again, we teach or recommend the historical method in where we take the initial round of readings and we start to build an initial trend on those points. And then uh, we let that initial trend of the decimal level tell us where the baseline should be set. Okay, I'm going to try and close this out. I feel like we're uh, playing with fire here because the dogs have, have awoken. So on the screen here, you can see our upcoming webinars. Oh my gosh, I'm freaking out. Um, we've got some great ones coming up. Um, so definitely look for the invite for next week. Um, it'll come out on Monday and then the following week. But we're trying to talk root cause. We're trying to talk work uh, management and electrical safety. So hopefully some good topics for folks. Um, so take a look for those and then I'll leave our contact info up and if you guys have any questions at all just holler at us and we'll get the recording up online here soon and thank you Adrian thank you everybody for joining us everybody have a great weekend we'll see you back here next week in the meantime stay healthy stay safe and we'll catch you guys later great thanks everyone